Thanks so much. And then we'll take um, uh, comments from our panelists and we will begin with Dr. Wang, please. Well, um, there are a couple of questions for me. I'm not sure if I uh, record all of them, but let me, I think uh, one of the questions is about you know, how to incorporate the measures of uh, subject well-being to the existing you know, uh, system. Well, um, I think uh, as we have said, uh, as we have seen the New Zealand government and also UK government has already started to collect such kind of data. Actually, it's quite simple and not very uh, difficult as we thought uh, to capture people's happiness because we have developed a kind of uh, questionnaires um, for that. Um, for example, OECD have published a guideline for measuring subject well-being. Uh, we can also follow UK government's practice. So it's just a couple of questions. We may just uh, conduct those kind of surveys uh, on individuals and households. Um, so it's not, not very difficult and not very costly to incorporate them into the existing uh, question, you know, surveys. And actually there are many international surveys, uh, social surveys, economic surveys, or labor surveys already includes those kind of questions. So the researchers and uh, so even several companies have done a lot of such kind of work, including Gallup. So I, I don't think it's quite difficult and challenging for the uh, statistical agency to do such kind of job. Well, um, and uh, some people also argue that we should, you know, measure the depression or the negative, you know, mental illness or those stuff. Well, yes, those are very important aspect of our life, but um, we should measure those negative, you know, emotions and we should also capture the positive side, right? Uh, because our life, you know, have a lot of elements there. And uh, as I uh, briefly talked in my presentation, the subject well-being includes both positive and negative aspects there. So we should just uh, measure all of them. And it's actually not very difficult because we have a quite a uh, mature um, questionnaire to, 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 to be used to do the like face-to-face -face or even on telephone or online service. It's not, uh, not difficult, just we need to do something. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much, very glad. Thank you, Dr. Wang. And um, final remarks from uh, Mr. Suart, please. Uh, thank you. Uh, I, I would like to highlight a conclusion from this uh, meeting. Uh, measurement is important for making good uh, decisions and also for improving the budget allocation process. Uh, as Dr. Wan and Dr. Russell have explained to us, well-being must be measured from a more holistic uh, perspective. Uh, new metrics, new index should inspire the way Parliament the work and how we decide the destination of the money we take from taxpayers. Uh, as, as they explain, growth is not wellness. Many rich countries are deeply unequal. So uh, I think that uh, well-being, more than economic uh, growth per se, should be the main objective of the work of the parliaments uh, around the world. Um, because what is not measured cannot be improved. Uh, uh, I, I want to insist that. Uh, but also, the political pro priority that has no money is not a priority. Uh, we can repeat that the gender agenda is important, but if we do not allocate money and make better public policies, it's only speeches. Um, the budget allocation process does not begin when the, when the executive branch submit his annual projects. Uh, it's a permanent process that begin uh, with accountability. Parliaments, uh, parliamentarians can influence the budget in the work of the committees and in the everyday work, uh, uh, evaluating uh, permanently uh, public policies. Uh, better accountability improves the efficiency of budgets and public policies. And that's, that's a, part, a part, very important part of the parliamentary process. So COVID has forced us to think outside the box, out of the box. And I think we will have to find new solutions for the economic and social effects of COVID. And, and that can start by seeing and measuring ourselves uh, differently. Uh, thank you for, for your attention and greetings for all. Thank you very much, Mr. Suat. And um, 
Final remarks from Dr. Russell. I'm so grateful for you staying awake and being here with us in the middle of the night. Um, a lot of questions were directed uh, to you, so please. Thank you very much. Um, uh, I'm just going to do those two specific questions from the chat. The first of all, has the public finance bill been amended since it was passed, the um, wellbeing one? The answer is no, it was only passed in um, February this year. So uh, we haven't had a chance to get to it yet, to change it at all. So nothing has changed there. Uh, the second question was around the methodology as to how we're measuring well-being um, and whether or not it's um, available else to, to be shared. Uh, some of it is stuff that um, people would be able to collect themselves anyway, things like voter turnout um, uh, in elections um, uh, uh, and um, so on. So people would, very different countries would have their own ways of developing those stats. I think what's a little bit different about what we're doing is um, uh, rather than just trying to have a measure of um, people's subjective well-being, we are trying to develop a series of measures that have a little more objectivity to them, um, like the number of people in New Zealand who speak te reo Māori. Um, the critical thing, of course, is not is how that actually relates to well-being. Now, our understanding is that um, in New Zealand, we do think that um, uh, more people speaking to Rio Māori does enhance well-being, but there's a there's an empirical question there as to whether or not it does. So I actually think we need both sets of measures: um, the holistic, subjective um, account of well-being, but also some of those objective measures as well. In terms of it being about available to other countries, I just don't know. Um, uh, a lot of those the stats are being collected by our Department of Statistics, and actually a whole lot of the measures are under development. Um, we don't think we've got them right yet, um, and it'll take development. However, I can find that out um, uh, just with an election coming up. It's a little bit hard to get to people at the moment. Um, uh, just a few final remarks. Um, I was really, um, first of all, I was delighted to be speaking with my colleagues from around the world. That's an extraordinary thing that has come out of um, this wretched pandemic is our capacity to use technology like this to connect around the world. Um, and I've, I've been really delighted to hear from people from Rwanda and Iceland and, and, and you know, when I'm stuck down at the bottom of the Pacific. So that's just been marvellous. Certainly enhanced my well-being. I was uh, really in interested to hear what is happening in um, Iceland. Um, and uh, I'll be having digging around on the internet to um, follow up and, and just understand how that compares to what we've done here in New Zealand. I noticed immediately uh, we talk about social, economic and environmental well-being, but we also, in New Zealand, we also talk about cultural well-being. It's because we um, uh, have a, a very, quite a diverse nation. We speak, uh, have about 180 different languages spoken in the country. Um, and uh, I'm not sure how many ethnicities are represented here, but because we're an immigrant nation, we have huge diversity here. So that cultural aspect might be more important here than in some countries which are more homogenous. But I don't know. Uh, a number of people raised um, gender issues. Uh, and someone wanted to know how women and children are included in our wellbeing budgets. Again, there are specific measures sitting in our dashboards around um, women and children. Uh, so we can look at those measures there. In terms of the, what we're actually doing within our budgets, we have a focus on child poverty. We have a Child Poverty Reduction Act uh, where governments are required to report on the extent to which child poverty has reduced year on year. We have to really focus on that child poverty. Uh, and in the first wellbeing budget and in, in the second one, uh, we also have a big set of work that's being done across government departments um, on family violence and on reducing family violence. New Zealand has a shameful record in that regard. Um, uh, one of the worst in the world, actually, which um, is really disgraceful. So we've got some, some serious work going on there um, to try to reduce that. Um, and other people raised the issue of the, the gendered response to COVID. Um, and you're right, one of, our, one of our big approaches to COVID here in the budget is what we call shovel-ready projects. And basically, they're big construction projects or, uh, which can 
be rolled out quite quickly and employ people quickly and get money circulating around our economy quickly. But of course, because they're construction projects, they tend to be oriented towards male employees. Um, and a number of organisations here have raised the issue that they don't cater well for women. And we've been talking about the need to not just fund our physical infrastructure, but to fund our social infrastructure as well around you know, our non-government organisations, which are typically staffed by women, and yet they provide a lot of the support in our communities. So um, I, I just really like to tautoko, which means to support those words when people talked about um, a gendered response to COVID. And there was one further issue which was raised, which I just uh, will have to really think about. So thank you to the people who raised it. And that was really, um, really comparing what was happening in um, poorer countries compared to what is happening in wealthier countries. Um, and of course, New Zealand is, is a pretty wealthy country on the world scale. And, we're, and again, we're so removed from the rest of the world, sometimes it's hard to understand the nature of what's going on in other countries. Uh, so thank you for raising that issue. Um, I think uh, in a globally connected world, I'm not sure that we can genuinely achieve well-being unless we achieve it for all of us. Um, so I think it is incumbent on um, uh, uh, wealthier countries to actually be very proactive in what we can do with respect to ensuring that all of us um, are able to achieve well-being. So kia ora tato and thank you for having me this evening. Thank you very much, Dr. Russell. Uh, what a pleasure and uh, some very uh, specific steps there that, uh, that people can look at. So thank you indeed. Now, um, Professor Sachs has joined us and is going to give us some um, final remarks and also kind of summing up now the four webinars that we've had um, and these sort of uh, experience from, from that. So please, right. Professor Sachs. Well, uh, hello to everybody around the world. Uh, thank you for a wonderful session and thank you for your leadership and all your inspiring work. Uh, I'm personally very gratified by uh, these uh, sessions that we've been having online. And the first uh, order of business for me is to propose that we continue them in 2021. Uh, I, I think it is, actually necessary for parliamentarians uh, around the world to be in regular contact with each other. Uh, and uh, it, it, it just doesn't make sense uh, to uh, do it only by physical travel when we have the means uh, to do it uh, routinely now. Uh, we need to be informed of what's happening around the world. We need to be sharing best practices. Uh, we need uh, in from the perspective of my country, I need to be sharing worst practices. Uh, we have uh, the worst government we've ever had. I just want to say to the whole world, don't do what we're doing uh, in the United States. Uh, we've got it uh, completely upside down here, but we're trying to take care of that in November. But in any event, we need to be learning from each other. This is uh, absolutely uh, essential. This is an interconnected world. The pathogens move fast, the money moves fast, the good ideas can move fast, the bad ideas unfortunately also move fast. Uh, so we, we need to stick together. And I want to uh, say that uh, the Sustainable Development Solutions Network, which was convened by the United Nations Secretary General eight years ago now, is ready to uh, participate uh, and uh, with the, the great leadership that uh, Kirsten and Gabriella have uh, provided, I very much hope we, we continue. Uh, second, let me uh, indicate that in my capacity as a chair of the Lancet COVID Commission, we'll be issuing a statement uh, on the occasion of the UN General Assembly about responding to the COVID uh, pandemic. Uh, let me say that New Zealand's response has been uh, absolutely extraordinary and exemplary. Uh, and uh, that is one of the best practices that we need to share with the whole world. Our message is this is a uh, suppressible virus. It can be contained, uh, but it requires a good and humane and transparent and science-based leadership. Uh, like uh, Prime Minister uh, Ardern has provided, and this is what we need everywhere in the world. 
our statement uh, contains a lot of information and I'll ask IPU and uh, Kirsten to share it with all of you. It will be published on uh, September 15 uh, on the opening day of the General Assembly. On the question of well-being, which was uh, so ably uh, discussed today, let me uh, personally stress the importance of both subjective and objective measures of well-being. Uh, as uh, Shun Wang, my colleague in the World Happiness Report, uh, knows uh, every year we're publishing uh, it rankings based on uh, Gallup uh, survey data of subjective well-being. This is extremely insightful data. Uh, it tells you how people feel about their lives. That is not just to be dismissed. That's how people are living their lives. And by the way, when they're unhappy, they'll tell you. And when they're happy, they'll tell you. And you will learn a lot. And so we already have uh, rankings for more than 150 countries each year. Uh, and we have better and better data coming. But use the subjective data as well as the objective data. Use the sustainable development goals also as a framework. Uh, there is a strong correlation between achieving the SDGs and ranking high on happiness. This was uh, one of our chapters in this year's report. And it's not for nothing because the SDGs are about doing good things, universal access to basic needs, gender equality, reducing inequalities in society, protecting the environment. They all contribute to well-being. And so use the SDG framework, and we also have the annual SDG index uh, to uh, help on that. There was a discussion about mental health and depression. This is extremely important. As uh, our colleague in the World Happiness Report, co-editor and co-founder of the report, Lord Richard Layard, has been stressing for 20 years or more, uh, the single biggest cause of unhappiness in the world by far uh, is clinical uh, depression. Uh, and this is a treatable condition. This is an illness and it can be treated. People need help. And there are known effective treatments. And uh, this can also be treated also with online help. Uh, so even in the midst of the pandemic, which is absolutely exacerbating mental health uh, challenges and problems and depression uh, in particular, uh, we need an effective response. So uh, I think uh, we have uh, heard a lot of these best practices. Uh, we will try to uh, call from this fantastically rich discussion today, uh, some of this to uh, uh, share with you. Uh, and uh, I look forward, uh, Kirsten, to our continuing uh, this journey uh, I'd like uh, for all the parliamentarians, bring your friends, bring your colleagues, same party across the aisle, uh, different parties, uh, bring them to this global online discussion. Uh, I can tell you, especially in countries ruled by presidents, we need parliaments. <laughs> we need parliamentarians. We need representatives. Uh, not just these uh, people like Trump strutting on the stage. We need people who are close to their constituencies that are representing the people uh, that, are, uh, that need to be heard and need to be very well informed. So let me close by thanking all of you for the invaluable work you do in representing humanity uh, and your own constituencies. And Kirsten, thank you so much for co-leading uh, this adventure uh, with uh, Gabriella, and I look forward to uh, a lot more and a, a, a new rich year of activities together. Thank you, Professor Sachs. And I think that's the perfect way to end today's session and the series of webinars. And I think we can already say, Professor Sachs, we will be back. Uh, and we will be in touch with everyone who participated in uh, each and every one of the webinars with more information on how we will do that. So again, thank you all for joining. It's been a pleasure and uh, please don't hesitate to reach out to uh, any of the organizers with any questions or any requests for the future webinars. Thank you everyone. <laughs>